Good afternoon, good evening, colleagues. Uh, those of us who are here in the room and to those of you who are watching online, my name is Peter Lowe and I'm the director of the Monk School. And I've got the great pleasure today of uh, kicking off this wonderful occasion for us here at the school. The Monk School, of course, as you know, is uh, situated on the land that's traditionally that of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently the Mississaugas of the Credit. And we're indeed very thankful for the opportunity to be able to live and to work and to play and to thrive here on this part of uh, Turtle Island. Um, this is a wonderful occasion for us at the Monk School um, to be doing this in person, uh, giving away the, Lionel, the 2023 Lionel Gelber Prize to um, Susan Shirk. Um, you can always tell how important an event is by how many introductions are made before the, uh, the star of the hour. Um, so I'm going to make a few, uh, and then we'll get into a wonderful Q&A with Susan and Janice. But uh, before we invite Janice up, Stein, uh, to talk about the Gelber Prize and this year's shortlist, um, I want to invite up a great friend of the Monk School, uh, Judith Gelber. Judith represents the larger Gelber family, uh, and Sarah's here as well, who have made wonderful con a wonderful contribution to the study of international affairs by uh, so generously giving the amount of uh, the big gift that allows us to recognize with what I think is the most important prize um, uh, in the field of international affairs, the best book in that field every year. It really sets the terms um, of what uh, books are going to matter uh, in the years to come, mostly because we choose very, very good books to win the prize, um, but also because um, so many others have won the prize before that it uh, gives that luster. And as you'll see today, that's most certainly the case with, the, uh, with the, this year's winner, um, Overreach by Susan Shirk. So uh, I won't say any more except to ask you to uh, help me welcome to the podium our wonderful friend and colleague, uh, Judith Gelber. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening to all. Um, it's wonderful to be with you tonight to celebrate Susan Shirk, the 2023 winner of the Lionel Gelber Prize. Um, thank you, Peter, for inviting me uh, on behalf of the Lionel Gelber Prize Board uh, to say a few words about my late uncle Lionel and the Lionel Gelber Prize. 33 years ago, the Lionel Gelber Prize was first awarded to Jonathan Spence on his brilliant, monumental, and historic book, The Search for Modern China. Unfortunately, Jonathan Spence passed away a year ago, but I'm sure that he would have been wowed by <laughs> Susan Shark's new book, Overreach, which picks up the threads on China over the past half century and informs us so well of the changing intricacies of its leadership and politics, which helps us better understand China today and provides guidance on our changing relationship. I love this book. <laughs> Overreach is a terrific read. Crisp, lucid, and some might say, best of all, it's short. <laughs> <laughs> Janice Stein, our jury co-chair, will have much more to say on the book when she introduces Susan shortly. The Lionel Gelber Prize was envisioned by my uncle in the years before his death. He had been a student and practitioner of international affairs since his days at the University of Toronto, from where he won a Rhodes Scholarship in 1930. And along with studying at Oxford, he became a great Anglophile. He lived much of his adult life in London, uh, with stops in New York, Ottawa, and Toronto. My uncle's career cut across the fields of academia, the political world, and international affairs as an advisor. But mostly, he devoted his life to writing books. Books like Susan's, where he brought the past to the present and provided an outlook to future power and relationships. Lionel envisioned the prize as his great legacy and specified that it be awarded annually to a book that was deemed best of the year on international affairs, published in English, and that would deepen public debate on significant international issues. Importantly, it emphasized that the winning book must be written in a style that could be read and enjoyed by the general public as well as the scholarly crowd. Overreach is most definitely that book in 2023. Lionel would indeed be so proud of his world-renowned prize as it continues to grow in influence especially through the careful oversight and polished management of the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy. We are so grateful for this strong and abiding relationship 
and thank you, Peter, for the creativity, support, and energy that Monk continues to exert on its behalf. Particularly and importantly, a prize is only as good as its jury, whose members perform the critical work. It is their selections over the years that ensure the prize's continuing prestige and renown. I very much wish to thank and salute this year's five hardworking jurors. Our co-chair, Janice Stein, founding director of the Monk School and professor of conflict management. Our fellow co-chair, Ian Shugart, recently retired clerk of the Privy Council of Canada and now a member of the Senate of Canada. Juror for a second year, bless him, <laughs> From Washington, Francis Gavin, director of the Kissinger Center for Global Affairs at Johns Hopkins University. Rosa Brooks, Georgetown University law professor, journalist, and author, and a finalist of the Gelber Prize in 2017 for her terrific book on Tales from the Pentagon. And from Mexico, Luis Ribio, chairman, Mexico Evalua, a public policy think tank, and global fellow at the Wilson Center in Washington. This is not a job for the faint of heart. It requires buckets of time, diligence, and careful evaluation to read and process a long list of books, develop the short list, and then choose the winner. Our most sincere and heartfelt thanks to you all. And so now, on to the pleasure of honoring Susan Shirk this evening with the $50,000 Lionel Gelber Prize. But Susan, you will have to wait to receive it. First your lecture, then the prize. <laughs> so now I hand over the podium to Janice Stein. Thank you. Thank you so much, Judith, and let me add my words. A uh, thank you to Peters. Um, it's an extraordinary gift that your family has made. Uh, and it's a gift that keeps on giving, uh, which makes it so wonderful. So thank you on behalf of all the winners and all the shortlisted books and everybody who loves books. Uh, that is uh, the community. Uh, my job today is to draw out the tension. Uh, it is to talk about the shortlisted books, and I will leave Susan's to last. Uh, but this was an extraordinary year, as Susan herself just said to me. This is a really wonderful shortlist. And it reflects the world, in, I think, that we are living in. Uh, the themes of these five books come together. I think we start with Bradford DeLong's book, and Bradford uh, is a colleague of, of Susan's, um, which is a look back um, at the economic hopes and disappointments in Western democracies for the last 125 years. And the, the book is sobering reading, frankly, because the arc of history did not bend um, in the direction of progress in the way that so many would have expected. If an economic history can be gripping, um, Bradford's book is gripping. It is an account really of the economic and social dreams of Western countries in the last century. And it's sobering because he tells a compelling story of flawed decision making that failed to realize those hopes and promise and left so many frustrated and open, I think, to the populist politics um, that we are all so familiar with. This book is a wonderful read. I recommend it to all of you. It enriches our understanding of the really deep political forces that are shaping the economics of our societies. That's the big wide lens, look back book. Um, there's a second theme, which um, is uh, a slice of the reality that we're living, but a very, very important one. 
And that is, of course, a study of democracy and authoritarianism. And uh, the next book, which is Revolution and Dictatorship, The Violent Origins of Durable Authoritarianism, is by R. Lucan Way uh, of the Monk School and the Department of Political Science here at the University of Toronto with Stephen Levitsky. And this really is a path-breaking book. Uh, it, it asks a very important question. Why do some authoritarian systems decline relatively rapidly and others endure for years and years and years? And the originality of that book, and it is, in fact, a highly original argument. And Lucan and Steve go deep into history and find that it is, in fact, the origins that are so important in shaping the trajectory of these regimes. Those that come out of violent revolution last the longest. That's not necessarily what we would expect, right? And that's sobering, too. So we have an Iranian regime that has now lasted 50 years. We had a Soviet regime that lasted, and as Susan will tell us, um, we have a regime in China that has lasted 75 years. So for people who are deeply interested in democracy, in the challenges that authoritarian, that authoritarian regimes pose to democratic societies, this is a really wonderful book to read. Very closely connected but different is a book by Guryev and Treisman, Sergei Guryev, who many of you I think might know, um, and Daniel Treisman called Spin Dictators, The Changing Face of Tyranny in the 21st Century. So if you actually think about these two books as a pair, um, Guryev and Treisman are asking the opposite question. What's new <laughs> about dictatorship and authoritarianism in our century? And they make a really interesting argument. And it's, it's also sobering, frankly. Uh, the argument is that these regimes do not have to resort to violence um, in the way that more familiar dictatorships of the last century had to. That they can manage um, and preserve their regimes by using sophisticated techniques of disinformation that the, the new media that are now so important in our processes are less violent, they're more covert, and the really scary part of that book, frankly, they're more efficient in preserving regimes. Guryev and Treisman show us how these new authoritarians use the newest technologies to come to power, how they use these technologies to stay in power, and how deeply undermining of domestic and democratic processes these techniques are. For anybody in the 21st century who wants to understand the new politics of authoritarianism, this is the book to read. We come to the fourth book on this list, which I know Susan has read and liked, um, because in many ways it intersects uh, with the interest that Susan has. This is a book that you would think nobody would read. <laughs> Who would read a book about semiconductors? You have to be a masochist, right, to do that. And yet, um, it's, a, it's an astonishing book. It is a gripping read. Uh, it is gripping. I, I tell you, you know, when you get tired of the thrills of watching a mystery on PBS, go read The Chip War, because you will not put it down. You read it in a night. Um, it tells the story again of the history of a tiny silicon wafer that changed every one of us. If you have a phone in your pocket or your purse, you have one of those tiny silicon wafers with you that are loaded <laughs> with transistors. And in fact, semiconductors have been become one of the principal sites of competition between China and the United States. And Susan 
will tell us more about that. I'm not going to say much more. Uh, but again, it meets the criteria for a Lionel Galber shortlisted book. It's written in English. He strips out the jargon. He tells the story. And it is a really compelling and dramatic read. Now, I saved the best for last. And let me say, um, the jury was just terrific uh, to work with. But Susan's book was the unanimous choice uh, of the jury as a book that changes in the deepest possible way uh, our understanding of Chinese politics. It is a master class, frankly, um, in analyzing the recent past of China um, and makes clear uh, the challenges that not only Chinese leaders face, but that the rest of us face in trying to understand and cope effectively with the challenge that China represents. There's so much in this book, uh, and I'm not going to say much because Susan is going to say a lot. But let me just tell you that um, most of us in this room would date the beginnings of a more challenging China a more disruptive China, whatever word you want to use, um, with the coming to power of Xi Jinping. Susan tells us that's not correct. And that actually we have to go back and understand that. And I found this, Susan, in many ways the most counterintuitive part of the argument, that we have to understand the beginnings of overreach in Chinese politics, not in the strength of Xi Jinping, but in the weakness of Hu Jintao. Uh, and that's, again, a more sobering story than uh, we would um, think if we were trace this only to the coming to power of Xi Jinping. This book um, is a must read. If you want to understand the biggest issue of our time, it is a must read for our governments. Um, it is a must read. <laughs> Anybody charged with making policy uh, and trying to build a, a system in which China can function in a less disruptive way, it's a must read Diana, as you well know, in any academic community. It's a must read for all the students uh, who are in this room uh, and want to understand where we've come from and where we're going. Let me tell you finally, just before I invite Susan to the platform, a little bit about Susan. I'll tell, I'm going to skip over the formalities. I'm going to shorten them, because they don't tell us really uh, enough about who Susan is and what contribution she has made. Susan is a research professor and chair of the 21st Century China Center at the School of Global Policy and Strategy at UC San Diego. Um, she is the author of China, Fragile Superpower. So you foreshadowed the book uh, that you wrote, Susan, and The Political Logic of Economic Reform in China. Susan has also spent time in government, uh, where she has to bring that knowledge to bear uh, on policy challenges in real time. From 1997 to 2000, she was the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State in the Bureau of East Asia and Pacific Affairs in the Clinton administration, with responsibility for China, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Mongolia. Many of the people that Susan served with are now senior officials in the National Security Council, in the State Department, uh, in the Pentagon. So nobody has a better understanding of what is driving current US policy to China than Susan. Now, that's for the formal stuff, OK? But that doesn't begin to tell us who Susan is and the field-making contribution that Susan has made. Susan, um, I'm not going to tell you how many years ago. <laughs> I'll leave that to Susan herself. But Susan was one of the earliest scholars um, when it was impossible to go to China to study China. Uh, there were very few scholars studying contemporary politics at that time. Um, Diana Fu 
is a student and a mentee of Susan's. And in fact, there's almost nobody in this field that Susan has either supervised, mentored, helped, advised. She is the field maker. I call Susan the dean of China scholars in North America. She has shaped the study of modern China. So when her book won, um, I had a personal sense, uh, frankly, joy, that somebody whose contribution um, is so singular in this field, who has shaped the contemporary understanding of China in the way that no other scholar has. Without Susan, there isn't the field of contemporary China in the way that we know it now, that this book is the 2023 Lionel Gelber Prize winner, Susan. <laughs> so generous. So, so kind. So nice. I am so moved and honored uh, to receive this prize from the Gelber family, the Monk School, the uh, review committee, um, and Janice Stein's remarks really uh, were very moving and thrilling to me. Uh, you know, um, I, it's true, I'm a really old China hand. I've been studying China for a very long time. And uh, when I went to graduate school, I chose to go to MIT rather than one of the major centers of uh, China or Asian studies. And the reason I did that was I felt that I wanted to study the most modern political science I could, and that my goal was to study China the way we would study any other political systems. In other words, uh, even though it was so difficult to go to China, impossible at that time, but my objective uh, has always been to kind of demystify China and to think about the competition among politicians in China. I like to call them pol politicians uh, because they are not some other category of people. They're ambitious, um, publicly interested people competing with one another uh, to advance in the system. So um, I feel very gratified when I uh, am with people like Diana Fu or Lynette Ong who are studying China in just that way. Um, and uh, embedding the study of China in comparative politics. Um, so that's very exciting to me. Um, I need to be positive and excited about that because so many other things about studying China and US China these days are really quite depressing. And you know, for most of my career, uh, the study of China has been a very happy experience because after Mao passed away, Deng Xiaoping and his successors um, managed to guide China toward some very dramatic reforms in the economic system, replacing central planning with uh, an open market economy, and uh, even in foreign policy, managing to get along with China's approximately 20 neighbors and with uh, the United States and other countries in the world uh, remarkably well, uh, despite the fact that China's political system, a Communist Party-led system, was so different than that of uh, certainly our Western democracies. And the fact that China was rising in economic, 
political, military power so dramatically. You know, many international relations experts uh, believe that in this context, a rising power and, and an incumbent power inevitably will clash in war. Um, as a st uh, student of comparative politics, I like to look inside the political system, open up the black box, and see all the human agency that is um, driving outcomes. And so my view is that nothing that's happened up from China's early days in the 1980s to today was inevitable, and that therefore the future isn't inevitable either. And uh, it's uh, and so we'll have to wait to see what happens. But the positive story of China's peaceful rise is an important one for us outside of China to be aware of. Because otherwise, many people think that China has always been the way it is today. Um, but in fact, uh, it had decades of great progress, uh, greater freedom for individuals, and of a restrained foreign policy, very sophisticated foreign policy, designed to reassure other countries that China wasn't a threat. Because China's leaders understood that there would be this inevitable anxiety about China as a threat because it was rising so fast, but through their own actions, as well as their statements and rhetoric, they sought to reassure other countries that their objectives uh, were friendly, their intentions were friendly, even as they became more powerful. And in the meantime, uh, American policymakers and those of other uh, Western countries also were quite generous in offering China a seat at the table, encouraging China to participate in global affairs, and lavishing a lot of status and respect on China to try to reinforce this positive trajectory. But then, in the mid-2000s, uh, around 2006, 7, 8, uh, before the Beijing Olympics, also before the global financial crisis, I noticed that Chinese policy changed quite dramatically. And, uh, in foreign policy, the most dramatic change was uh, becoming more assertive, even aggressive, in the South China Sea, which had not been the focal point of popular nationalism up until that time. And of course, it's a very important area for global commerce and uh, where China and other and Southeast Asian countries um, have conflicting claims over the waters and the small rocks and islands within it. But what was significant about when China's um, maritime agencies, including ones that were not really all that powerful, like fisheries, or the Coast Guard, Marine Surveillance, they started kind of shoving around the fishing boats and drilling rigs of other claimants uh, in their coastal waters where, according to international law, these other claimants have uh, a certain kind of quasi-sovereignty. Uh, and 
uh, that really changed the view of China, what kind of rising power it was. Because up until that time, China looked like a very responsible power, but this behavior in the South China Sea altered the narrative about what kind of rising power it was, and people started seeing China as more threatening. Excuse me. <laughs> Meanwhile, domestically, before the Olympics, there was also a tightening up of control over society uh, and a tightening up of censorship of the media, internet, uh, Weibo, and uh, commercial media. And at the time, I thought, well, this is before the Olympics, and in China, this frequently happens that you get a tightening up before some big event to make sure that there are no unpleasant surprises, but then the event occurs, things go smoothly, and they go back to normal and things loosen up again. But in this case, that didn't happen. In this case, things continued to remain tight. And this period under Jiang Zemin and then the first term of Hu Jintao, which you would call really peak freedom of information in China, when you had investigative reporting, debates on all sorts of issues on Weibo, uh, people reporting train accidents or fires immediately uh, using their cell phones and posting videos. This was information, and information from abroad as well, penetrating the country. That period was no more, and things just tightened up starting then and continuing to the present day. There was just a big uh, hospital fire in Beijing, and uh, for eight or nine hours, there was absolutely no information allowed to be reported on that, just a, a fire in Beijing. So, uh, so there were these changes in domestic and foreign policy. And this was the period of Hu Jintao's uh, governing. He was a very modest leader. Um, a lot of people viewed him as a weak leader. And the governance system was based on collective leadership, a kind of oligarchic rule, which Deng Xiaoping had installed as a way of preventing the abuses of the Mao era, the over-concentration of authority, which Deng Xiaoping criticized openly. And blamed for the, the tragic famine of the Great Leap Forward, the Cultural Revolution. He said it was the, oh, it wasn't Mao personally to blame, it was the over-concentration of authority that leads to arbitrary decision-making. So to prevent that, he introduced term limits, retirement ages, peaceful turnover of power at the top, and a collective leadership of a standing committee at the top of the party the, um, that would presumably deliberate and question one another and lead to a policies, sensible, pragmatic policies of restraint. But surprisingly, that's not how collective leadership actually operated under Hu Jintao. And that was the big surprise to me. And so in the book, I tell that story that hopefully people still are interested in. Uh, maybe having seen Hu Jintao, 
be led out of the 20th Party Congress. They might be kind of curious about Hu Jintao. I hope that inspires them to read the book and find out about how Hu Jintao governed China. But as Janice said, it was in some ways the weakness of the Hu Jintao regime which led to the beginnings of overreach. And let me take a moment to remind you what overreach means. Overreach means to take things too far, to do things in an exaggerated manner, in a way that snaps back to harm yourself. So it's counterproductive, self-defeating, um, overdoing it. And that's what I talk about in this book. The overreach that began under Hu Jintao and then uh, became even more uh, extreme under Xi Jinping. Because at the end of the 10 years, two five-year uh, terms of Hu Jintao, China's system was uh, uh, struggling with the beginnings of overreach, but also extreme corruption because all of these political oligarchs in the collective leadership had a lot of opportunities to collect corrupt earnings because they uh, controlled whole sectors, different sectors of the economy and society. So that enabled Xi Jinping when he came to power in 2012 to really have a kind of mandate for a more centralized, concentrated leadership. And, um, but no one expected the kind of regime we have today. People thought Xi Jinping would still be a market reformer. His father had, was a highly respected uh, senior official who was a colleague of Deng Xiaoping's, a long march cadre. Um, and she himself had served in coastal provinces where there are a lot of private businesses. So people thought he would be like Hu Jintao, but more authoritative and more able to tackle corruption and prevent the splits in the leadership that we also saw on the eve of the turnover of power in 2012. You'll remember, I, want, I have no time to tell the whole gory story about Bo Xi Lai, but there was a public split in the leadership at that time. So um, Xi Jinping comes to power, and the first thing he does really is take control over the military, and the second thing he does is to introduce an anti-corruption campaign that is effectively a purge of all the politicians who might be rivals to him. And uh, this anti-corruption campaign was very popular with the public, but the consequence of it and it continues to this very day uh, in what, so it's become what Zbigniew Brzezinski in talking about the Soviet Union called a permanent purge. We're now in at least the third, if maybe the fourth phase of this purge. And um, it continues so that the uh, officials who once were so trusted by Xi Jinping that they were the inquisitors in the first round of investigations of officials 
and the punishment of them are now the targets themselves. So, um, and this purge has put so much pressure on every subordinate official in the political system so that they are uh, constantly worried about the risk that they might be targeted. And to the extent that they still have ambitions to rise up in the system, they believe that the only way to do that is by demonstrating their loyalty to Xi Jinping. So what does that mean? The way the system operates is that all the officials try to figure out what direction Xi Jinping is heading in. And then they jump on the bandwagon behind his policies. And they carry out those policies because they want to be noticed as the loyalist of the loyal. And then they carry out those policies to uh, a more extreme degree than perhaps Xi Jinping himself might have wanted to pursue. So you get what you might call overcompliance with the central policy. And uh, of course, nobody dares to give accurate information about what are the actual costs of the policy to China. So the feedback loops, the information feedback loops are not working. Xi Jinping lives in an echo chamber of head nodding in praise, basically. So um, he doesn't have very good information about what is actually going on. So the overreach that we see over the last 10 years and certainly see as now we're at the beginning of the third five-year term that Xi Jinping's leadership is the result not just of Xi Jinping's personality, his character, his ambition for China, but also the way the system operates is there's this mechanism that generates overreach because of the um, uh, pressure that all the other politicians are under. So you look at China's actions today, the policies today, and I don't have time to go through the whole long list of the pressure, the military pressure uh, in China's near abroad, it's uh, pressure on Japan, on Taiwan, in the South China Sea, the economic coercion against Australia when it called for a scientific investigation of the origins of COVID, um, the war with casualties at the border with India, uh, economic coercion against um, uh, South Korea, Lithuania, um, the, uh, so the wolf warrior diplomacy, the rhetoric by Chinese diplomats, which is very undiplomatic and uh, alarming people in other countries, the targeting of the diaspora of ethnic Chinese uh, in countries like Canada or Australia and expecting them to work for the service of the party in Beijing. A lot of these arbitrary decisions and policies that are being carried out to an extreme degree and have sparked and international backlash against China. So China looks so much more threatening than it did a decade ago. And 
Uh, obviously, this is very costly to China. Basically, the government, the party, has encircled itself by a balancing coalition of other countries that are trying to deter Chinese aggression and protect themselves. Domestically, there's also been a high cost. Uh, the crackdown on the private sector has led to s slower growth, uh, youth unemployment, uh, and a lot of private business people have, le have left for the exits because they have no confidence that they won't be expropriated, basically, by the central government and party. And, um, uh, and then, of course, zero COVID. Three years of zero COVID with inadequate preparation for the transition out of this uh, draconian uh, method of controlling the epidemic into a more flexible approach. So um, all of these policies under Xi Jinping have been costly to China. They've not been good. I, oh, and I, how could I forget? The uh, alignment with Putin at the very time that he's engaged in this um, unprovoked, brutal war in Ukraine. So all of these uh, actions um, of Xi Jinping, ha which have been carried out with so little resistance that we can see, that's one of the most um, sad and st still perplexing things to me. And it suggests to me that uh, Deng Xiaoping did not carry out demaoization, if you will, the institutionalization of a governance system in China uh, thoroughly enough. <coughs> he strengthened the institutions of the party, like the Central Committee and the Politburo and the Standing Committee, but he did not create a, uh, a strong legislature, a National People's Congress, or rule of law, a legal system. And as a result, when you get a uh, dictatorial leader like Xi Jinping, you see very little resistance because people are afraid to challenge him and there are are no institutional mechanisms for checking this concentration of power. So it's, um, it's a sad story. Uh, we're, we're back to a regime that has certain resemblances to the uh, Mao era. Uh, and we have a lot of frustrated officials in China, the ri risk, I think, still exists of splits in the leadership and of uh, social resistance as well. So um, that's the story of overreach, how we ended up with overreach. We have a, and so today, we have a relationship between China and other countries in, it, in Asia, in its neighborhood, a rela relationship between China and the West, which has deteriorated significantly. And right now, there's a, um, a very tense and hostile relationship between China and the rest of the world, especially 
uh, the West, the United States, Canada, Europe, as well as China's neighbors. So um, the question, you know, I this the book is really not a policy book. It's more a the story of politics inside China. But the last chapter does look at um, uh, how the United States and other countries might address the problem of China and uh, make some suggestions for how to do that. I, uh, and I have to say that I am really uh, worried and disappointed uh, by the actions of the United States and the way it's addressing the China challenge. So what's interesting about the book, and I hope you find it that way, is that on the one hand, it's very frankly critical of the nature of China's political system today. But on the other hand, I'm also really worried about the way we're handling China today. So I talk about overreach and overreaction. Um, and I call for a, um, a greater diplomatic effort to engage with China in the future. So I'm not going to take the time now to get into my policy recommendations, but I'd be happy to answer your questions about them. So thanks very much. You're over there. So thank you, Susan. That I, I have to say that's a cri de cœur by a scholar um, who began studying China and saw the optimistic trajectory of a society that has grown more quickly and more broadly than any other society in human history. It's really a remarkable story what China has achieved in the short time. Um, and then your sadness, Susan, um, and your disappointment at what you have seen in the last almost decade and the concern you have. So let me turn a little bit to policy now. Sure. But let me go back and ask one question because you rightly begin to describe the politics of weakness, which was in this environment of collective leadership Hu Jintao was unable to rein in the corruption. And that opened the door, really, for a corruption campaign. And that is true more generically in other societies. There is a politics of grievance when corruption is so obvious. Yeah. And societies support these kinds of actions. What could Hu Jintao have done differently? Because that's where your story starts. So that's a policy question counterfactual policy question. Mm -hmm. About the, especially about the corruption. Yeah, because this opens the door. Yeah. Um, well, I think probably could have been bolder in uh, the market reforms, which kind of stalled out at about that time. So you had a semi-planned, semi-market economy, which is ripe for corruption, right? Because the official officials control access to the market. Um, what else could he have done? I mean, uh, poor Hu Jintao, I mean, at the time, another thing he could have done, which some of his advisors, and I write about this in the book, uh, recommended that he do, 
is to put term limits and other institutional um, rules uh, in the party constitution to lock them in. And he didn't do that. Uh, and so that's why now we have Xi Jinping serving a third term. Uh, and so he didn't, um, he didn't manage to do that. He only went so far. Uh, and let's see what else he could have done. Hard. It's, it's very hard to the kind of the counterfactual of thinking how you could fix a, a kind of hybrid system of plan and market um, was ripe for corruption. Yeah. Really ripe for corruption. Of course, opening up the media more also is another way of supervising officials and their economic activity, right? So you could have gone even further in opening up the media. So that leads me to the first question from the audience. And if you want to ask questions, um, there are two um, people who are walking around the room with white cards and pencils. Just fill them out. I can't promise to get to all of them, but we'll get to some. Susan, your reference to the Constitution. What could have? So the question wants to know, um, there's a party constitution and there's a state constitution. If, how much leverage was there for embedding constitutional checks um, to restrain what we're seeing now with, with Xi Jinping? And if you look at the encroachment of the party on, um, on the market, and on the state over the last decade, were there any were there any constraints that could have been enacted that would have stopped that? Well, certainly, you know there was when Mao died and Deng Xiaoping came to power, China's legal system was really quite primitive, and there was a lot of progress in the early days on rule of law. And then it kind of stalled out. You know, you had a wonderful um, uh, chief justice kind of of the Supreme People's Court named Xiao Yang, who I was privileged to get to know when I served in the Clinton administration. And he was promoting a lot of rule of law reforms, but uh, then they got blocked yeah. and they stopped and he's, He's in jail today, along with a lot of other legal reformers. So I'd say um, uh, rule of law, I think, is really the most important thing. The story you're telling, of course, is pressing, because we see in Poland, we see in Israel, the rule when Supreme Courts are activists and assert the rule of law, there's pushback by party institutions and politics that are threatened. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. Susan, you talk in the book um, about your disappointment in the United States and the way it has overreacted to overreach. So here's the hard question from somebody mm -hmm. in the room. What do you think should be done? To, and the word in the question is to deter overreach. And I'm not sure the answer is in deterrence, but how do you think about the policy challenge? What can the United States, Canada, and other Western leaders do um, to encourage China to shift its trajectory? Yeah, I think, um, I think we have moved too soon to a kind of just balance of power kind of uh, mode. And I think that um, uh, it is still possible, although quite difficult. But let's remember, it's really only six years uh, in which Chinese foreign policy has really become very problematic. And, uh, and if you listen to Xi Jinping's speeches, 
there's still a lot of things about win-win and, you know, it, it's, it's different from Putin. It is definitely different from Putin. So I think he still wants to be embraced by the rest of the world. That seems to still matter to him. So I think that um, what we need to do in addition to balancing against China's more aggressive mode, that we also need to uh, show Xi Jinping that there's still an out. There's still a way to join the world community peacefully. And tell us a little more. What would how that do we look do like? that? Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. of course, right now I'm in a very sour, depressed frame of mind because um, that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> you know, study China. There are a lot of ups and downs. I'll tell you. Um, because uh, I had hoped that Tony Blinken would be going to China. Instead, we had these balloons that got canceled. And uh, now the Chinese side is really taking a very hard line. I think they're very worried about what we found in the balloon, with the balloon. The US side is actually being very diplomatic and very um, careful. You notice that we've done this investigation of the balloons, but we're not making a big deal about it right now because I think we really are hoping to resume a process of diplomatic negotiations. Um, and so we are signaling in various ways uh, but, you know, she goes to Russia and he, um, uh, you know, is, um, he's kind of, uh, he could have tried to sustain this great triumph with Iran and um, uh, Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia that they accomplished. But instead, he goes to Russia, and there's nothing about that. Really, very little diplomacy occurs, very little encouragement to Russia to do the right thing here. So uh, and instead, he's avoiding contact with the United States. So um, that's a very tough spot. That the, and it's very unusual for the United States to say, as it's been saying publicly, that we, uh, we're trying to arrange a phone call and the president won't take the call. That is really unusual. Yeah. And I give Washington and the uh, Biden administration a lot of credit for acknowledging that that's the situation, for revealing that. Um, but I think it's that she is worried that right now he's kind of on his back foot, and he wants to first talk to all of the Europeans. He's trying to put a wedge between the United States and European democracies. Which is OK. That's not a big problem for the United States, especially if it leads to some compromises on China's side. So we'll have to see if, in, in fact, he does that. So that, this question is about the wedge strategy, Susan. Um, it's certainly with Japan, for example, where there is historic, there is no country that has been more astute and prescient about the challenge that China poses uh -huh. than Japan, and yet they have managed a two-track strategy of economic engagement even while they are doubling defense spending. Japan and China just reestablished their hotline, um, which the United States and China have not been able to do, and that's a good kind of minimum for deconfliction. Uh, paint the picture for us. Is that part of a wedge strategy? Is this a precursor to what you hope will happen? 
Uh, what do we have to learn from what we're seeing with France, Germany, Japan, and their relationships with China? Well, I, as I said, I agree that China is trying to um, reach out to them and uh, in order to put more pressure on the United States. But I don't see it as problematic because I actually think it's in the interests of the United States to uh, try to stabilize relations with China, not to build up two blocks, two hostile Cold War blocks that are confronting one another with kind of hair trigger um, risks. That's not a good thing. So, um, you know, if China thinks that it makes us uneasy for them to improve relations with other Western democracies or other democratic countries, but you know, I, I actually don't think the Biden administration is worried about this. What's the next step of the Biden administration that you think might work? <laughs> well, the Biden administration is, has signaled in a number of ways that it wants to engage in negotiations now. It wants to stabilize relations. Um, they've done that in a number of ways. Um, it's kind of subtle. You have to notice it. Um, but they are trying to get the phone call scheduled. They would like to arrange um, a face-to-face -face meeting at least after the um, APEC meeting in, that's going to occur on the West Coast in the fall. Are you optimistic? Um, I'm not. I'm not hugely optimistic because I see that uh, that the relationship has become extremely hostile, and that it's going to be really hard for both sides to bend. Uh, right now, the, um, uh, you know, if you look at the sanctions policy, for example, in the United States, I, I'm quite critical of that because I think that the uh, imposition of sanctions on China uh, that we've gone a little sanctions crazy, and that we're not uh, linking the sanctions to China's behavior sufficiently. We're just imposing sanctions. Um, on the Chinese side, of course, they're refusing to even speak to the White House, which is really bad. So, um, you know, I don't know. I, I ha I'm waiting to see, because now that COVID is over, it's possible for people to travel back and forth. Certainly people like Diana and I are wondering what kind of welcome we'll get when we go back to China. All of the civil society um, connections that we've woven over so many years you know, we're watching to see whether or not it's possible to revive, revive them. We are really quite concerned that universities in China seem to be under pretty tight restrictions about what they can do. Um, so I think our universities will do the best we can to try to revive uh, these people-to-people -people civil society ties, and we'll just test uh, what the Chinese response will be. So one question that follows directly on that theme, Susan. Um, Xi Jinping reacted most strongly to the ban on advanced semiconductors um, and advanced technology, and made the argument that the United States, of course, is determined to encircle China, to contain China, 
and to prevent its rise. Um, knowing China as you do, is that the interpretation that it's fairly widespread um, among Chinese scholars and, and, Paul, and officials that you speak to? And if so, is um, what's the next step? Is this a strategy that you start to walk back by tying it to specific behaviors? Just to generally, um, because this seems to be the kernel of the rage that has led to the freeze. Um, it, it's connected directly to the chip war. Yeah, yeah. of course. Well, um, starting in the Trump administration, but continuing right into the Biden administration, they, uh, we have gotten, I think, kind of trigger happy with our use of sanctions. And um, uh, it is quite counterproductive. I mean, uh, we, it signals a kind of unmitigated hostility. It's also costly to ourselves. So um, I would like to see more of a um, uh, negotiations with China, telling them here are the things that we find the most problematic. We are prepared to impose sanctions unless we can figure out a way of working some of these problems together and try to work it out afterward. You know, use it as leverage, but not impose it up front. So what we see over the past six years is simply impose these sanctions, you know, on, um, on, on China. And I just, um, I think it's made Xi Jinping feel that it's hopeless, that the U.S. is bound and determined to uh, create a kind of new Cold War. And so he doesn't see any hope that if he moderates his behavior, there'll be any benefit to China. So I think we need to get back to a, a more flexible approach. Let me ask you an impolitic question. When you speak to Secretary Blinken, are you meeting a receptive audience when you make these suggestions? Well, um, I haven't spoken to Secretary Blinken in this way, but I, you know, um, but I, yeah, I, I think that we have taken the, um, the sanctions approach too far and it's too rigid, and that we need to uh, open up an opportunity for China to moderate its actions and get um, some benefit from doing that. So the next question wants to switch gears just a little bit and talk about the relationship between Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin. There are as many versions of that relationship. Um, how do you understand it? Who is driving whom? How close is it? How fragile is it? Well, I think, you know, um, I think Putin really did snooker Xi Jinping. And yet, Xi Jinping, we didn't somehow give him the option of pushing back against Putin. Um, so what happened, of course, is that Putin came to the Beijing Olympics. He um, and he didn't really reveal that his plans in, um, you know, to uh, in the Ukraine, and therefore he uh, he put Xi Jinping in a very difficult position, and. I think that she just felt that Putin was his only friend. They've met more than 20 times. I think she feels internationally isolated. 
and that he therefore admires Putin's strength and feels an affinity with him, fellow strong men. And so he's let himself get pulled over into the Putin camp, which is very costly to China. And there are many people in China who are very unhappy about this. Remember, Ukraine, uh, China was Ukraine's largest trading partner. So it, it's not, um, it, this is really something that Xi Jinping, I think, ultimately will be blamed for in China. You know, I, I have a feeling that the Chinese history later on will not view this very positively. Susan, I mean, certainly Xi Jinping has made it clear that he opposes the use of nuclear weapons, um, which is not a message Vladimir Putin wants to hear. He has repeatedly said he supports territorial integrity and sovereignty. That is not music to Putin's ears. How much room for maneuver does Xi Jinping have in this next period? I think he's got a lot of room for maneuver, actually, and he just needs to use it a little more. Um, but you know, it is worrisome. China used to have a very minimal deterrent mm -hmm. under Xi Jinping. Now China is building up its nuclear deterrent, its nuclear capabilities. We want to initiate a dialogue on strategic weapons. We've been trying to do this for a long time, Chinese side saying no. This is not good. I mean, I felt a lot more comfortable when China had this very restrained policy on nuclear weapons up until very recently under Xi Jinping. So um, this, is, this is a pretty dangerous situation, actually. And then the whole command and control system in China, I, have, I don't have much confidence in it. That's a whole other very discouraging subject. Uh, let, me, let me just switch um, to the people level now, yeah. because uh, there are two sides to, to the subject. The first one um, asks about the so-called sea turtles, the Chinese who have returned home. Uh, to make their careers, to work in China, not anticipating uh, what you did not anticipate, Susan. Uh, and the question is really interesting. It says, first of all, are they likely to have any influence um, in the system? And then, oh, do you think they're likely to stay? Well, no. I mean, so many private business people are leaving. I'm sure you have many here, as we do in the United States and other places. Um, uh, and also, of course, Singapore. And, mm -hmm. uh, but um, I think many private business people, or at least the ones that I talk to, they now are convinced that Xi Jinping is really hostile to private business. I mean, this is very different than previous Chinese leaders. He has a pretty primitive view. And every now and then when, you know, the economic growth is slowed, slowing down, they have economic problems, and then he knows what he's supposed to do, the right thing to restore the confidence of the private sector. So, they give him the script to say, but it's so obvious he really doesn't believe it. And it's very obvious to the private business people, too. This is one of his, I would say, it's one of his most rigid points. And, um, you know, that's, that's very damaging to the dynamism of the Chinese economy. That bodes very well for a ill for a country that has to push its way through the middle income trap then. Yeah, I mean, it's, um, it's, it's a very tough time. Um, and so a lot of private businesses and even things like agriculture 
you know, they're leaving and going to other places uh, to try to set up shop. Here's the, other, here's the other side of the story, Susan, and this is a Canadian problem as well as a problem in the United States. We have a very large, um, highly educated, um, very loyal Canadian Chinese diaspora yeah. in Canada, which has enriched our country of course. in every possible way. Um, but um, there are stories of uh, intimidation of Chinese students, even at this university, who find that their families are threatened that that's the leverage that the embassy will use uh, when, and they are asked to engage in political activities. Uh, that is a, a story that is roiling Canadian politics right now. It's not the only one, it comes in many variations. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's uh, deeply unfair to our Chinese citizens um, because it invites all kinds of um, unwarranted <laughs> suspicion. What advice do you have? for Chinese students, uh, Canadian Chinese students, uh, who are at our universities, uh, and for the larger Canadian Chinese diaspora? Well, you know, um, first of all, don't leave. Do not leave, because there are many more welcoming uh, people than people who are not welcoming. And uh, the potential for what you can achieve in an open society like Canada is much greater than what you can achieve in China. And, um, you know, but it's, it, it's very, it's so sad to see. And of course, it's this anti-Asian hate problem has spread beyond Chinese because people don't know, you know, when people are walking on the ground, you know, walking around, who's from Korea, who's from Japan, who's from China, Singapore, wherever. So, uh, but, uh, you know, I hope that we can maintain these ties, and certainly we in the West should not overreact here, you know, because we, it can get very insidious. You know, this is like Red Scare stuff mm -hmm. from the McCarthy period, Soviet threat. So we need to exercise self-restraint and a welcoming spirit toward uh, immigrants from all over the world, because that's what's made our society so successful. You know, that's a, an encouraging and important note. To really, really important, I very, think. To end our discussion on we're okay. out of time, but Susan, I'm gonna invite Peter back, but Susan will be signing books um, outside, um, and there is a reception. But I, I know I echo what Peter would say, that the investment um, that we make in scholarship, um, in understanding other societies deeply, in the way that Susan has throughout her whole career, is just invaluable. It's hard to explain sometimes to the public why this matters so much. But if we don't have informed, educated, deeply knowledgeable people about other societies, our own society will do so much less well. Thank you, Susan, well, for thank all you. you do. And I hope, I hope uh, that if there are any students here in the room, there are. don't give up on China. Do not give up on China. And it's a, such a great place and so exciting to study. And when I hear of people who are abandoning the field, and that happens more and more, that, that's really a big mistake. So. Thank you so much. Uh, before Susan goes out to sign books and before we invite you all to join us for reception, I want to invite uh, Judith up uh, one last time to do the, 
the small matter of actually conferring the uh, the the prize and the and the uh, and the reward the the award uh, so deservingly to Susan Shirk, uh, Judith. Yeah. Thank you so much for this wonderful lecture. <laughs> Great questions and answers. First, I'd like to give you a plaque that is the Lionel Gelber Prize plaque. And then I would like to give you the award, which I hope will cheer you up. Oh. <laughs> I sound so depressed, don't I? <laughs> thank you. Well, thanks so much. I mean, of it's uh, it's really a rare thing for any scholar to not just get a symbolic honor, but actually to get a check. It's amazing. <laughs> We're so so generous of well, you. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>